going to talk about my uh, my last annual report. Just just give you a sampling as I, I do that, and uh, because it gives you an idea of what I do, or what the or more importantly, uh, what the people of Ontario do, utilizing their rights in the Environmental Bill of Rights, working through my office and things. So uh, we we deal with a Kevin touched on some some of the reports. I now issue like four reports a year. Uh, it's go 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 all the time. Um, but uh, one big one, which is my annual report, and so we're going to give you a sampling of some of the stuff, and, and in doing so, I'll give you an idea of uh, what some of the big issues are in, in, in Ontario. So that's, that's the, the center we're talking. The, these four topic areas, or five, sorry, uh, are giving out outline, there are the topics we go through, and basically uh, that comes out of the annual report. And just uh, I'm going to take SAMP within, there are many more issues in there, but that's the touch on it. So the first one is, uh, is a section called Engaging uh, Provincial Solutions. The, I guess the one message that the report I, I was called is called Engaging Solutions because one of the challenges I found this year, it was, uh, this reporting it came out in the fall, it was an election year. And when we're talking uh, about election years, governments, you know, one of the years lost because of the election. The, election, the government changes, even though it's a liberal government, it's a change in, in liberal government. And they, to some extent, we knew it was coming, of course, and we knew that they could sort of wash their hands of the past to some extent. So my usual mechanism of uh, reporting on uh, the government saying you're not doing a good job here, or you are over there, and that sort of thing, was changed a little bit. So we, we wanted to move, move upscale to a, a few bigger ideas in order to, to give the new government, it could have been a, a, a conservative government, you know, perhaps an NDP, but uh, uh, we wanted to raise some, some issues on, on a higher level for, for the, uh, uh, the new government of the day. What's, what are some big topics that we can point out to the new government in terms of things that need attention? And what we came up with is the Great Lakes. Now I've reported many, many times uh, over the years on, on issues related to the Great Lakes. But there's not much happening in terms of improving the Great Lakes in the past few years. You probably haven't heard much in the media or going on. And the reason is, is that there isn't much happening. We, we govern what's happening in the Great Lakes uh, mostly driven by something called the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement between Canada and the United States. And it's big, that thing has been existed since uh, the 70s. And it's uh, been the origin of a lot of the big cleanups and big changes in the Great Lakes. But every few years it has to be renewed. And uh, it's, we're, we've been in long discussions with the Americans uh, recently about renewing it. And it seems to be going on and continuing and extending. And because there's really no final agreement, we hope there's one this year, uh, there's been, not much has been going on. Because without the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement between Canada and the United States, there can't be what we call the COA, the Canada-Ontario Agreement, as to which lays out where the federal government puts up some money, Problem puts up some money and they get on with some cleanups or some improvements or some monitoring for, for the Great Lakes. So not much has been happening. And so we, we want to draw attention to the fact that it's been stalled and stalled and stalled. So, so we said, well, wait a minute now. Every time we talk to the province, they say, well, we have no COA, Canada Ontario Agreement, because there is no Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement, so we can't do anything. Well, and you know, we, we, we started looking at it, and you don't have to read all these things. Or anything, but just going back over some of the things and the issues in Ontario, we found these are some things that Ontario could do. Pick, take a pick. Engage a solution. Do something uh, along the lines. These are just pick anyone off there. Uh, these are all problems that are within provincial jurisdiction that we could do something. And the argument was, let's get them something. Let's pick one. Pick two. Pick three. And do something. So uh, there, that was a, 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 an initiative to try to drive the province in that. There's another big bridge of thing, and, it, and this is one of the things I do is, is, I, is I report on uh, big decisions that the government did, in fact, make. And, and last year, or the, back there in the reporting period, uh, the government made a big decision called the Far North Act. And I'm just going to talk for a minute about that a little bit. Map of a big part of Ontario, northern Ontario, but it's far enough north uh, that North Bay doesn't make it on. North Bay's down here, and there's Timmins, and here's the highway with you know Cochrane, Caphurst. Long whack, that sort of thing, Lake Nipissing down to Thunder Bay. Give an idea. The key, the key line is this one. This funny little line here. This, and that line there is the division between what we call south of that is the area of the undertaking. It's a technical term we're running to the to the area we have the industrial forest management in the province. That's that's it, that's where we have forest management, management extraction. North of that line is the 
is the far north, and there is no environmental assessment on forestry. There virtually is no forestry at all. There are virtually no roads. There are no roads. The last is the highway. There's, there's the odd little road that runs up here, but essentially no roads in that area. It is truly a huge wilderness. Now, recently there's been some development. The world's most profitable diamond mine is right there. And uh, the Beers has a, a mine that's 90 kilometers west of Attawapiskat. And that speaks to what's going on. So we have huge potential. And this is a huge area. You can take the country of France and drop it in there. And, and the key point is there's virtually nothing going on up there, and there's virtually no access. But there are 29 uh, First Nations communities that have a constitutional right to be consulted about uh, activity on their, on their land. So that posed the problem. And we did have some major conflicts on the land, mostly relating to mining. Uh, we, you know, we, we threw some Indian chiefs in jail and stuff over the fight, but that didn't seem to do any good. And, uh, and we, uh, so we, we have this vast area, and then, and then we found up in this area, here's Lake Nimagon, so up in here is something called the Ring of Fire up in there, vast mineral reserves, and so now we've got lots of potential up there, but we didn't have any mechanism to develop it. So the government passed this Far North Act, which is a piece of legislation which says, well, about half that area are going to set aside in some kind of protected status, not parks, some kind of protected status, and the other half are going to open for business. And we'll set up a mechanism that the 29 First Nations can, can have a, a role in planning it, have some say. That's what these colored dots are, by the way, to some of the first stages of, uh, of planning uh, from, with the First Nations to open up the industrialization of the North. So I reviewed that, the talk, uh, that, that, that legislation. And I gave it a pretty good review, actually. Uh, seemed to solve some of the problems and seemed to open up uh, uh, an awful lot of opportunity for the people of Ontario. So that's the kind of stuff. Another thing we talked about, uh, there's a big challenge in the world and on biodiversity, uh, a big challenge in Ontario for biodiversity, and that's the protection of the living systems uh, of the earth. And I'm not going to talk exhaustively about that. I could talk for days on that, but instead of we went again for a, uh, to draw the, the government's attention to, to what's going on on the biggest and we chose the fisheries in the Great Lakes. We decided to have a look at the commercial fisheries in the Great Lakes. And this slide and the next slide are the same x-axis. They, they, they represent what happened in the Great Lakes according to land and fisheries docks from 1885 up to about 2005. And Let's just look at that for an illustration. The colored lines are various kinds of fish. That this is the, the landed tonnage or you know tonnage of fish, in various species. The one that's missing is Atlantic salmon, which were common in lakes originally at the European settlement, but went extinct relatively rapidly. But you look so pick something. The uh, lake trout goes uh, is the red line it goes down, and you can see lake trout disappeared in the 50s. Part of it uh, utilization. Part of it is the uh, the uh, lab prey uh, when they opened up the seaway, right, which took, hit the hit the lake trout hard. Lake sturgeon, you know, they're like everywhere else. They they live a long time. They went they went down to very low levels almost immediately. Lake herring, herring, sorry, herring, big peaks back then, but run off to very low levels. And blue pickerel, which incidentally we we also had in Lake Nipissing, one of the few locations, uh, the Great Lakes, and, and and but we had blue pickerel, uh, erratic but large numbers of tonnage of blue pickle taken in <coughs> fall away to almost nothing in the 50s. So, you know, these for these species, the manage, fisheries management line isn't very healthy. Let's check some others. Same, this is the same axis. Well, now we have walleye. That's a yellow pickle that we're, we're familiar with here. And we can see that uh, walleye had some good periods of time and stuff. And recently, you know, we had Lake Erie went through a very bad time back in, in this period of time. That's when the perch are so dominant because it was very eutrophied, very green soupish, right? And that, that really favored the, the perch. That's when the perch was restarted, but a lot of the whitefish fell off and the walleye fell off. And then we, we started getting the phosphorus out of the water and we had a, a rebound in the lake in the 80s, very much healthier condition for the <coughs> pickerel and things. But here we are, here we are in, these, in this current trend up in the, in, the, in the last decade and a half or so. So I wouldn't say, that's really the most ideal fisheries management curve that I've ever seen in those two slides. And the, so, you know, it speaks perhaps to a problem. So we looked at, so how do they manage the fisheries in the Great Lakes? Well, as it turns out, 
first of all, it's, it's, it's spotty, but they don't really do the, you know, it's, it's, it was so easy to talk about this here, I have to revert a little bit because I remember when the, when the MNR cut off the, the, the we had the, the best scientific walleye data set in the world on Lake Nipissing, right? Scientific, and we're talking trap netting, in skill netting, real measurements of what the population was. They closed that down in, in uh, late 90s, sir, and, uh, and I always remember uh, these working with these guys. Frank, we went out and we said, well, we need at least index yield netting, so uh, Frank hired, uh, hired a company to do the index yield netting, and came to us and said, okay, no, I, got, I just uh, signed a bill for $20,000, so I've got to raise some money right here. And so we had to run out and raise some money, and we did. <laughs> That's why Frank, Frank can still retire. He's not, uh, he's not just so old. Still old money. <laughs> well, I still some. But the, the, the point was, that in, in the Great Lakes, uh, they don't do that kind of scientific measurement of the population. In most of the case, there's some, but Great Lakes big place, but really not. These fisheries things are, are set on, on the landings and what they actually net and bring in. And then they extract from the population. And there is some science that I'm not, I'm not totally discounting you, but nonetheless, you're trying to determine what the population of the fish looks like, how healthy it is, based on what you're catching, rather than what's maybe really there. And so, you know, one of those, so we look at this and we said, now that's the first thing. The other thing is, when they set up the allocations, of course they have to negotiate with the Americans, because the Americans have the other side of the lake. And when they set up the allocations, that's all done sort of quietly, there's no public uh, discussion of that. So we, there's no transparency on how they set the allocations in the fishery. So, given that they're not doing too well, given that they don't have any really good science, and for most of it, and given that the allocations are done without any kind of public scrutiny, we think maybe there's some things that should be improved there. One of the stories, we talk about cage culture. Down, down in Georgia Bay, they, 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 in cages, they raise rainbow trout out in the, on the lake. But the lake, of course, is, is uh, crown land. That's, the, that's our land. Uh, and if you, if you raise trout, like we have a trout hatchery down the road, if, we, uh, if you raise trout in a, on land in the trout hatchery, you, you have various, we call them race trout tanks. Water will be through, and at the end of the line, you have to have a little bit of a sewage treatment situation to treat all the, the feces and excess food that moves through to keep the water quality back before you return it to the environment. Well, but if you go out and put a big cage in Georgian Bay, you don't. All the excess, the feces and excess food just falls through the cage down onto the lake. And there's a lot of people very concerned about that whole thing. Uh, and I've been chasing the Ministry of Natural Resources for 10 years uh, on. To, get some serious policy and get some, uh, clean up the act, but they haven't been able to deliver for me. So they, 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 their policy on crown land use for agriculture is 10 years overdue. So I just nibble away at them and chase them on. And the, uh, and the, the last time when I, they promised the policy to the people of, um, supposed to do, I forgot exactly, a couple of years ago, and they said, you know, I went back, so where is this thing? And they said, oh, well, we had to move people off developing the policy in order to issue the new license renewers for the cage culture. Well, we said, well, wait a minute, the whole thing is about the license renewal for the cage culture, but well, that's, that's where we're at. Anyway, here's the thing that's really stirring up the, uh, the beehive here. That's the Endangered Species Act. That was passed in 2009. And, and I'm, a, I'm a fan of the Endangered Species Act. I'm not a fan of how it's being implemented by the Ministry of Natural Resources. There are lots of problems. However, so I take, so we, we take a, a real run at it in, the, uh, in my report. We talk about, now, they passed in 2009 the Endangered Species Act. I'm going to give a quick lesson in it because it's, it's, I think it's a really good piece of legislation, the way it's done. It's a, start with the Endangered Species Act. There's, they broke it into three pieces. And they said, okay, because there was a problem with the old act. The old act didn't have enough flexibility in terms of sometimes, you know, sometimes you have to do things that kill endangered species. It's just the reality. Uh, you know, dangerous snakes will drive across the road and somebody will run over it. Uh, you know, things happen, right? And, and, and some things we need are essential to our socioeconomic system. And there wasn't the flexibility in the old act. So they brought this new act in and they broke it down into three parts. The first part is you get a, you get a, a team of scientists who are just biologists or scientific experts, and they're called CASERO, that's their acronym. And their job is to determine, look at all the science and say, is a species 
endangered, or just three categories, endangered, threatened, or special concern, the only two matter. Endangered or threatened or not. What does the science say? Okay, let's keep that separate because that's just a scientific decision. That's the first box up there. The second thing it says, it says, okay, let's, we're going to put a recovery team together. And the recovery team will have some science be experts in the biology, but also some of the practical things. So like, like if you have a recovery team uh, for American eels, which have a hard time with getting chopped up in hydroelectric facilities, you better have some people who know something about hydroelectric facilities and some of people know about, about, about uh, American eels and, and, and so on. And, and let's, let's put it, okay, if we were help this, help this species recover, what could, what could we do? What are, what are our options? And what are the options? And that's a technical session too. That's not a political session. And then the, the, the recovery plan goes to the government of Ontario, the Ministry of Natural Resources. And, they, and, and at that point, the government's supposed to have, issue what we call a, a government response. And it, they're supposed to incorporate the socioeconomic considerations. They're, they're supposed to say, well, you know what? We recognize that this is the problem. We recognize the species is, is, is at risk. But, but you know, we can't do much about that, or we have, can't change this. Oh, but we can do that. Or we, maybe we can change over here. But whatever we're going to do, that becomes the government response. And that has to be an honest, open reflection of all the, the constraints and, and, and uh, things that can be done, can't be done, to, to, to help a species that's at, at risk. But in fact, when I look at those government response statements, and that's what my report says, they were really, really, really lousy. They were just like these manby dandy uh, fieldized government statements that didn't actually solve the problem. And that's a, a, exactly where we're at with a lot of the species. We had that with conflicts on the land, people, uh, people's business being interfered with, other things happening, because the government will step up and be honest in terms of their, their government response statements. So that's, that was the endangered species. But the endangered species continues to be a, a big issue. There's things happening currently in the budget on that, right? But when I talked about endangered species, I always put, I put in some interesting examples. And I put, uh, I, I put, I put an article on this one. Remember when we saw the cougars in the Earth Bay a couple of years ago? Or something? In those days, Evan and I were still pretending there were no cougars. Then. Evan and I had this long standing thing. It's, oh, it goes back 30 years. It, and they, they pretend there's no cougars. But everybody keeps seeing cougars. <coughs> Evan and I said, no, no. We saw a coyote. No, no, it wasn't a coyote. It was a coyote. It was a cat. Oh, we saw a lynx. No, no, it had a big long tail. Big long tail. Oh, you saw an escaped or a, a, a pet killed cougar. Somebody <laughs> let free. I can't you know, that's what they do. Yeah. Like, of course, we all know people who have the pet cougars. And they're, you know, the general responsible people. Like, there must be a whole bunch of them around North Bay. There's a lot of cougars <laughs> around North Bay. But anyway, that was, I thought, this is a good story, it was entertaining, in fact, because last year Evan and I actually admitted that there are wild cougars in Ontario, uh, which is the first for them. So I thought that'll be this, you know, the, the media darling, that'll be the charismatic species that the media will pick up on the cougar story, right? No, not true. The, the hit of my annual report in terms of the media, in terms of endangered species, was this one. Snapping turtles. The story we did on snapping turtles was, was about the problem with snapping turtles, of course, is they, you know, they're a very interesting species. They're, they're very, very long lived. They, they, it takes them 20, they have to grow 20 years before they even lay eggs. And they, you know, the big ones are 100 years old, or certainly 80. They've got, we've got them in Ontario track, identified individual numbers that are 80 years old. Uh, and and the, the problem is in Ontario, they are, uh, a, they're not really, they're not endangered, not threatened, they're a species of special concern, which is the one that's sort of on the watch list. But for some reason, if you have a fishing license, you can take two a day. Well, I know you guys don't take too many snappy turtles, but you won't be surprised. But they, they're, they're, they're worth a good buck in some of the Asian markets in Toronto. So, so there are people that will go, and if you can legally take two a day, you can go into a pond and clear out a hundred years worth of turtles in just a couple of days. So the question I raised was, why have we got two, I mean, even make it two a year or something, but why do you have a two a day license on, on something that's uh, a species of special concern? So that was the issue raised, and it played big in the media right across, not only, I, I, I did interviews in uh, Manitoba, from Manitoba on these things, so it was uh, fascinating. Changing the topic, but oh, we, from 
well, related to biodiversity and in that category. The, I also had a, actually had an application. We got, I can receive applications from the, from the public about uh, requests for review for of government policy and things. And one that we got reserved was, was a request for review to look at the, the, the need for considering green infrastructure or, or some people call it building integrated vegetation or aspects of just including the ecosystem in, in the in, in the in this building of infrastructure ranges from everything from from uh, this green roof in uh, in Toronto to uh, to the way we integrate uh, uh, the living system into our highway structure and things. So so uh, it was interesting, and in fact, there was a wide range. Of, the, the point was that uh, we sent it to a whole bunch of different ministries, saying, you know, yes, I mean, Infrastructure Ontario builds things, but other, other ministries, and transportation, other ministries do infrastructure and, and integrating it in properly into the living ecosystem. You know, is a valid and interesting area and, 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 and an important area. It was, all the ministries turned it down, though. <laughs> but it gave us, you know, some of these ideas you have to go introduce and just encourage and, and get them on the, on the agenda. And, and the fact that the government, the government ministry considers it and has to respond and say no, gets them thinking about it. And so it's the early stages. The title is Stormwater Are Ner Neglected Headwaters. And, and, the, and one of the things that became obvious to me, and I made a big pitch in the, in the report, was about, about stormwater and our and headwaters. And some of the Conservation Authority people that, uh, when I start talking about stormwater and headwaters, they get all antsy. You know, they're not headwaters. They say, well, think about this. You know, if you have, uh, a, like, you know, there's a little jargon here, uh, you know, a stream with no tributaries, just a starting little stream. If we call a first order stream, if it joins another first order stream, you get another second order stream. So let's picture that. Two little, but one of them's in this beautiful setting with trees and meadows and flowing down through and all full of living things. And you know, the conservation authority, other people would say, yeah, we've got to protect that. That's beautiful, you know, headwater stream, right? Beautiful. Well, but the other stream that joins it down a little ways is coming off a big box store parking lot, right? And it's all asphalt. Like it's, 25 acres of asphalt, <laughs> and it flows down. You've been in those you know, box store parking lots. They, they, all the water's directed to these grids in the, in the asphalt. Got them here, and those grids. And you think, well, it's going down the drain. Well, it, it is going down the drain. But underneath, by the way, underneath that grid, anything built in the last 20 years, there's a, what they call a, a, an oil grid separator, which is a very expensive piece of hardware. Some of them cost a hundred thousand dollars. Just one of those drains in there, and it's designed to trap. Any oil and re and everything and remove the system and trap all the all the sediment and, and not I mean sand and grid is obvious, but also you get all sorts of tire where I get charges and stuff in my my, my office. You know, people come out with all this stuff. I have these jars full of black gunk in my office. And if you want to come down, I'll show them to you. <laughs> and the uh, I, in fact in my annual report there's pictures of my jars of black gunk and I didn't they didn't say it. One day my my staff came ready to come in, Gord, where are your jars of black gunk? I said, well, they took them away and they photographed them and they put them in the annual report. I didn't even know it until I saw the annual report. Um, but the point is that these oil grid separators are to keep that stuff out of the water because the water that flows out of them goes down and becomes the other half of that headwater stream, right? So, and that, that all should work fine, except that one of the problems we have is we don't pump those things out and clean them up. They've got to be regularly maintained if they're going to work, if they're going to keep our streams. Uh, wow. Now, there's, some of them are on municipal property, and generally in the province of Ontario, the municipalities do a pretty good job of maintaining them. But many of them are on, increasingly, they're on these big parking lots that are privately owned, and they have to be cleaned out by the private interest if they're going to be down at all. And in fact, it's not happening, and, if, and, and a lot of the reason is just silly, because it, it's, a lot of these companies, they say, you, you go to them and say, you know, have you cleaned out your oil grid separator? And they'll say, uh, what? Somebody else built the place, right? They don't know what's there. They don't even know the need to do it. So we got to get a system in, in a place that these things get pumped up. Because if the if the stuff flows down, uh, you know, after the little stream, it ends up into uh, stormwater management ponds, and that's what I'm going to talk about now. Yeah, because because that sludge thing here, uh, no, go back. That's in Richmond Hill. That's a pond. It was it's all sealed up because nobody was looking after things. There was all sorts of 
stuff coming down. This had been a big pond that was supposed to delay water to, to filter it out at a, at a reasonable level into the receiving stream so it wouldn't get erosion and things, and it just filled up with mud. Now, there's a really good engineer in, in uh, Richmond Hill who said, we got to do a better job, and he talked to his council into spending $6 million, and, and they did this, and I, it really, it's, to my eyes, it's, it's, it's a beautiful job. I'm not sure I can do it justice up here, but you know, know that that, that butthole's all gone. This is all planned and constructed. There's a winding meandering. That's all land constructed creek down here. That, that's the normal flow goes down. There are, there are fish and minnows and things in that creek now, and it discharges this way. And then it, but it overflows into this pond when it gets too high. The pond's not the discharge. So it's a permanent pond. It's all planted with trees. And you can't probably get out this lake, but maybe some of your sharp eyes can see a little bit of a discoloration on there in the grass. That's actually one of, that's a, a, one of these hard concrete mesh surfaces with, with holes in it, the grass growing through, so they can bring heavy equipment down every 10 years or 15 years to clean that up. So this is, this is a really beautiful living system, all planted up and working, really functioning, and an and improvement on, on that mud hole entirely. So it can be done. Uh, this was done by, the, by Richmond Hill Municipality at their own expense, uh, not done by the Ministry of Environment, uh, by any kind of Ministry of Environment standards, and, and one of the complaints I had is, we know we can do this, we should be doing this all over the place, Ministry of Environment upgrades your standards. Now, here's the uh, uh, more controversial parts of, of, the, of the talk here tonight, and this is, this is really something that I, I'm getting a uh, stronger and stronger opinion on, okay? And because it's very, very current, I think it's happening. Uh, I used to work for the Ministry of Environment for many, many years. Uh, I've worked in natural resources on it with, or, you know, related to them for many years as well. And this is the allocation as a percentage uh, for Ministry of Natural Resources, Ministry of Environment, uh, the percentage of the government operating budget, okay? Now, I, I've shown you the picture, so i have to take it off before you know that. If I said to most people, and I've done this, I've actually done it, we've actually sent people into uh, malls and said, you know, how many cents of the government dollar gets spent, actually the question was, on the Ministry of Environment? Most common, I mean, I don't expect people to know, but it's, but it's good to get an impression, right? Every, every, every hundred cents the government spends, how much does the Ministry of Environment spend on all their various programs? And the most common answer is three to five cents. Is that very, very much from what would you thought? People with it, you know, the real answer last year was 0 0.31 cents, less than one third of a cent, okay? But the people think that we should be spending that kind of money. In fact, if you add M and R and M O E up in, 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 ten, in, in budget year 10 and 11, you add both budgets, all the M and R is bigger than M O E, and you end up with three quarters of one cent. We don't even spend a cent to protect the natural environment uh, in Ontario. And remember, that's what we spend. M&R and MOE both charge a lot of fees that cover off most of that anyway. So it's the hunting fishing licenses, the park fees and everything, they cover off most of that. So that's, in terms of net tax money spent, it's very small. So three quarters of a cent for that ministry, but look where it was. It was, these are all normalized dollars, the same equivalent comparable. In 92, 93, it was over two cents almost two and a quarter cents. That's, and it's been a steady climb, and, and uh, since we're in, uh, in, in uh, you know, it's worth pointing out two points, I think, in uh, Nipsey, um, and that is, this is Mike Harris's first budget, so you can see, you're talking about declines. Not everybody, everybody's getting into this, right? That's the NDP period, this is the Mike Harris period, and then we're in the Liberal period. Now, this one here, you see this little, you see, the, you can see from here to here, a little increase, that's the Gordon Miller increase. <laughs> <laughs> because this year I hammered them, that's the first time I hammered them on budget for MR funding, and so the next year they increased it a little bit. <laughs> and then they went back to their old house. But, but if you look, it's the same tendency, they just did it one year, just because I, I created enough heat that they get a little more in one year. But, uh, you know, we're in budget, it's consideration, we're down there now. So, not funny, because it's not good. And, and it means, and I don't know, we've got to convince these people that the natural resources, the natural environment of this province is worth something, and it has inherent value, and you can't keep discounting and discounting and discounting. That's, that's my message anyway. So, 
So the other thing I do, aside from looking at gut decisions the government's made and considering the, the, the various applications from people who made through my office through our process, uh, I also have the latitude to say, well, you can talk about uh, new things, uh, things that, um, anything you want to, Gord, that basically is the outlaw says, Gord, talk about anything you want to. No. So uh, I do this section called Emerging Issues. I do it every year, most years I do. I find I talk about things that uh, are, are, well, sometimes they're not talked about in the ministry, you know, things you never hear. But I run into my, because I have a good team, and we look at the science, and sometimes it's new ideas, things that never come. Other times it's things that should be talked about, maybe not so unusual, but should be talked about, that aren't being talked about. And that's what this year I came up with. This year, I, I, I looked around, and, and there is a big issue that's emerging, it's certainly a big issue in the United States, and it has implications to Ontario, and it's simply not being talked about, and that's what they call fracking. And that fracking is the, uh, and, and I thought, well, you know, the, the, the time is right to, to, because we don't have any fracking in Ontario yet, but we haven't had it in Quebec. Quebec started 31 wells, 19 were in problems, and Quebec had to shut it all down as a moratorium, because there were problems. And it's certainly extremely controversial in the United States. So I thought, well, you know, there should be some initial talk and maybe some initial look at the, rec the, uh, the regulatory structure you know, for this, this new technology as it relates to extraction of natural gas. And, uh, and that, you know, so I, I put out some basic information. So the piece I did was a very basic information piece, but it gives you an idea, just for the people who don't know what fracking is, it has really changed the natural gas uh, that sort of production industry. Most of our gas used to come from Alberta. Out west now, 20% of the gas we were in Ontario is coming from Pennsylvania, down in the states just south of uh, Lake Erie. And here's here's the deal. Here's the technology that they've adapted. So what you have is you have a well that you drill down and into a very a deep, usually very deep, tight layer of, of shale of a, a, a mudstone, a, a, a rock. And in that, in, that, in those formations, there, there is get natural gas. There is methane, but it's sort of bound in the solid rock. The stuff out in Alberta that we used to get is in like open sandstone. So if you imagine it, if you put a hole into it, it starts flowing through the holes and the gaps in the rock. The shale is not, it's not uh, permeable to that degree. So what you do is, and they have this really slick new technology where they can turn these drills and they can go horizontal pretty much as far as they want. And, they, and this one is a linear like that. But picture from the top, you'd see them going radio, right? And then they, and then they uh, the key is to put a very good casing here which is one of the problems. And then, and then they start, uh, they pump down uh, up water mixed with a fine sand, mixed with usually some kind of petroleum used for a lubricant and some uh, and then a little, you know, like Colonel Sanders special herbs and spices mix of chemicals. It's a secret, just like Colonel Sanders. And, and they pump that down and then they lump this thing hydraulically. Wham! They do it once and then they drill a little further down. And then they whoop the thing hydraulically, bam, and they shatter the rock. And then when the water dries those little pieces of sand into little cracks. So then when they've, they've gone far enough, so you get these fractures every time they wham the sucker, and then they pump the water out again, and all those much as they can the sand and, and the dredge. And then you're left with voids which the sand grains hold open. And so the gas is a way of it's able to escape, get into the into the uh, pipe and, and they can pump the gas out of the, out of the earth. That's fracking. And it's, uh, uh, so it's, it's key to the key is to find the formations where the, the gas may be available. And as I said, it's a very big United States. By the way, it's changing everything. Gas is very, very cheap right now because of fracking. There are some complications. The, the, the fact that, you know, in, we're used to the idea that a gas wells in Alberta would last for 20 or 30 years and then you can build another one. These things fall off at about 65% uh, in, in the first year. So they, you drill one and three years later you gotta drill another one just to keep up with where you work. So there's a lot more drilling to these things. But nonetheless, the green area is where there is shale, uh, fract fractable shale at, at depth. Uh, we don't know if it's economically viable yet or not. There are no productive well, production wells in Ontario. Uh, there are gas wells in Ontario, a few. Uh, but the, but the, so we're looking, that's the shale that's available. The best bets are the dark stuff, well, actually, I'm gonna contradict myself, it just happens that this formation is 
yielding good on the American side, even though it's near surface. The drillers like the deep stuff, and most of this is deep stuff, but it seems that the uh, uh, that this is perhaps this one yields. We don't know about that yet. So there, there's a couple of exploratory activities going on, and whether or not we get fracking in Ontario is yet to, yet to be seen. Certainly, we're not as good as the, the deposits in Quebec or Pennsylvania, so we're sort of second or third tier development. But uh, my point is, we should be on top of the sucker right now and uh, uh, get them to make sure our rules are good so we don't have an embarrassing situation like Quebec where we'll the bunch of them spend a lot of money and then they have to shut it down. So that was the emerging issues. That was the sort of more or less the end of, of my report. So <coughs> I just close off before I go to questions. I you know, always close off with a fan, you know a good quote. And uh, I don't know if you listened to CBC Radio a few years ago when Jasper Friend of there. You know I, I don't you know there's some of the negative stuff in here. Some stuff. So remember just the immortal words of Jasper Friend of He says, "Stay calm, be brave, and wait for the signs." Some sort of correlation between fracking and earthquakes. Okay. Okay. I, I'm going to revert to my French language um, spokesperson beside you, and he'll explain it to you in French. No. <laughs> no, no, no. I want your. <laughs> uh, you know, Louis, the the uh, that's cleared up very good. Very. There's been some very good research just in the last couple of weeks to come out. It's very confirmed now. There is a positive link between uh, earthquakes and. Uh, there's small earthquakes, but nonetheless earthquakes and fracking. There's no question. I mean, that was suspected. It had been alluded to, but they've done some hard geologic science now, and it just came out. Uh, uh, the definitive paper just came in the last couple of weeks. So yeah, there is. And in, and, uh, in Britain, where they're putting together uh, regulations uh, on this, like I've called for here, uh, they have put they put uh, rules in relating to the magnitude of earthquakes caused. In other words, I think it's quote me because I might be wrong, but I think it's a you know, the magnitude scale of earthquakes. I think if you cause earthquakes greater than 0 0.5 magnitude, you have to take some other measures or have to stop or whatever. But anyway, they've, they've actually built the fact, the recognition of the fact that there are earthquakes into the regulations. So it is positive. It's, now, the magnitude of earthquakes we could expect anything would vary on the local geology. You know? And uh, we don't have any fracking shales up here, but, but you know, we do have an active, active fault right, right, right underneath us here. And uh, so if you had that active fault near fracking shales, that would be a larger, much larger risk than, than having a relatively stable area. But there was, in um, Oklahoma, they had like 80 earthquakes. So she was just something that was a fault. Yeah. Well, with regards to fracking in, in Quebec, what specifically were the problems that they ran into that were uh, prevented them from? Well, okay, I'm gonna put some uh, quotes around this because there's, there's some dispute about this, okay? But the kinds of problems, uh, the, the, the problems you have when you're defracking, uh, the, 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 the sort of the worst technical problems you have are, are so you remember you put, you're banging pressure down here to break the rock. This, uh, you know, the fracking guy, the drillers will tell you, wow, well, we're, not, we're not in the open aquifer, that's way up here, we're down here. Mm -hmm. Yes, but if, you, if you're pressure, and you're whacking this thing, this, this pipe has to be strong enough to sustain that pressure. And if you, you can get a, if you get a failure in this, that's when you get cross contamination problems. Right. And, and, and I don't think we have actually water contamination problems in, in Quebec, although there's been some in the states alleged under investigation. Uh, but you can get gas in, uh, escape, uh, natural gas escape, which is dangerous in itself. Right. So that's that's the first second problem. Then after, but Quebec did clearly had problems on the uh, on the surface. What do you do with the wastewater? All the trucking that's involved, all the uh, surface disturbance, they, the area that's key in fracking in Quebec happens to be that, you know, that that uh, St. Lawrence Valley lowland stuff, right by the St. Lawrence River, that old Happy Home settled, mm -hmm. you know, where the French farming communities go back several centuries and they have strong traditions, and then these suckers are being pumped up, you know, every every kilometer down the road. So there was tremendous land use clashes, and they didn't. Uh, Anticipate the sort of impact on the rural landscape in, in, in a very traditional rural landscape. Yes. Question about um, the resource spreading and sharing of our First Nations people. With respect to this? And no, not with respect okay. to this. Oh, yeah. Sure. Yeah. Uh, with respect to the uh, resource spreading and sharing of our First Nations people, how will the I mean, say something in ten years there'll be sheiks in Ontario? Some of them. So how how can um, we 
we develop relationships more so that they can develop these partnerships with Germany or well, I, th I think that, that where, where we're at in that whole discussion about resource sharing relationships is that, it, and, and we moved along to some degree. I mean, the, we, don't, we don't tax our revenue, our, our resource generators to the same extent as other jurisdictions. Like, you know, most, like most uh, natural countries nationalize their natural resources to take big share of stuff. We don't. We have private sector development, and then we take a modest share of the government. So, and, and, you know, the First Nations are precipitous participating in that model sharing of a lot of areas. But what their main discussion now is that, wait a minute, for, for the far north and places like that, saying, we're the people, we live here. Uh, there's nobody around, nobody else but here. So we should be sharing an economic, not only should we have jobs there, but, but if there's companies and spin-offs and, and that kind of thing, there should be our companies. And, and, and they want to sort of notch up into the next level of economic activity. And I think really that's where it's going in, in the sense that uh, help us you know, to have service companies that, that you know, service your industry, to help us have, have uh, companies that uh, supply stuff to your industries, you know, and that's, 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 that's the model we're talking about. Are they about. tiering it to, as a consultant? Like, are they creating their own bank consultants oh, yeah, yeah. to the, broker the deals? The, they're um, setting up all sorts of companies and stuff, that, yeah, and they have uh, development funds now. So it's fairly early on, but it's, there's, there is some, here and there, some really hard stuff happening. My one friend, he had a deal going with the fire, there's a moratorium on mining. He's the only mining company to keep going because he actually knocked on the cheese store. Sure, sure. And I come in and talk to you, have a cup of coffee, and that's what kept his deal. Yeah, man, there's, there's more and more of that now. It, it, it's, uh, I don't think the government stuff has gone as fast as, as any further than it has been the last years, but it's an awful lot of stuff, company to company, and, 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 and the First Nations are very involved. GPS. So when the when the salt truck comes, it's not even a salt truck. It's spraying brine, 
and it's coming down, and, and the, the, the doses is being uh, allocated on that location from the guy who's driving a truck, driving a truck because the computer's dosing the road, and stuff like that. So, and they're out in front of these things with these brine solutions that melt the snow, so it won't stick, and, and they can remove it easily, and oh, it just goes on and on. Uh, these handling facilities are, are much more sophisticated, sophisticated than they ever were in the past with these to cause us to know that. So Ontario has really moved on, on uh, the technology related to minimizing salt impacts, which is really nice to see. But we could do with more of it being spread as, as that, okay. <laughs> more of it being spread, more of the technology being spread, not the salt being spread, into the municipalities. <coughs> Gentlemen in the front row. I uh, think that's why we have uh, some Australian companies Taking care of roads. Well, that's dumb. <laughs> okay. You, you talk to no, no, no. Australian companies taking care of roads. And I think it's Bridgeport, isn't it? Whatever. It doesn't matter. It's the bidding process, MTO. It's all me. Sorry, it's all me. Yeah. Nothing to do. And, but it's done to MTO standards. I know that. So MTO has the standards, and whoever does it has to. It's a constant. Yeah. 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 We're under the uh, the government downsizing initiative. In regards to the MNR, right? Do you feel that uh, Stewardship of Ontario will still have a role to play? Well, my God, I hope so. We're trying to scramble now and find out what, what exactly I have in mind. We, we, there's certainly some massive changes coming to the Ministry of Natural Resources mandate uh, that are in this budget, and it's not clear to, to me at this time. If we're scrambling in Queen's Park trying to find out the reason behind it, and the magnitude of it, and what, it, what the implications are, which is essentially what you're saying. But certainly this. It would be the greatest folly to, at a time when you're further downsizing the Ministry of Natural Resources and closing offices and limiting, limiting their, their, their capacity to deliver the programs, it would be the greatest folly to also cut back on the stewardship program, which is the, one of the only mechanisms they have of magnifying <coughs> with the, the, the impact of their work with respect to with volunteer citizen in, in, in participation. So, uh, it would be incredible if they do that because it would represent a double assault on, on the on the role and, and the mandate of the Ministry of Natural Resources. So I do do not I hope they do not do that. I, I expect that they won't. By God I'll howl if they do. Tell you at the end, your license fee is so much, and 
you know, the, the fee for doing this is like two bucks and that's fine, but that's done by a private company. So why they need to amend the legislation, I don't know. Because already they have, a, an, I would think, an efficient system. Get my honey license, efficient license. 